Hi, everyone. I'm Kyle. Can you guys hear me without the mic? Am I good without the mic? People in the back, you can hear me in the toque? Okay. Hey, um, I'm Kyle. I'm from Redis Labs. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, it's really interesting to do something here in Alberta. I live in Edmonton, and oftentimes I'm traveling to like Philadelphia or uh, Tel Aviv or something like that to give these presentations, so it's nice to kind of have a semi-hometown crowd, uh, even though Calgary, Edmonton, let's, uh, you know. Um, so uh, I'm the head of developer advocacy at Redis Labs. Uh, Redis Labs is based in Mountain View, California in Silicon Valley. Uh, I work remotely, um, and my job as the developer advocate or head of developer advocacy is to work with uh, basically technical roles and how they work with our software. So I work with developers, I work with operations people, DevOps, data scientists, uh, data engineers, that sort of thing. So uh, two things I want to ask you. Uh, first, who here has heard of Redis? Please raise your hand. Good number, fantastic. Who here has a picture of their pet on their phone? A few people. Please bring it up and have it handy. We'll use it later on. Uh, I know it's a strange request, but we'll go forward with it. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Redis is an in-memory database platform. So we're a NoSQL database. We're the seventh most popular database in the world, actually. Um, we have uh, uh, over a billion Docker downloads. Uh, we know that there's not a billion people using Redis. There's not a billion developers in the world, but those are CI pipelines and things like that. Um, Redis has been around for two thousand since 2009 and it's open source, and uh, we are Redis Labs. Uh, we're the home of Redis, we fund the development of Redis, uh, we add new features, we do everything else, and we also have Redis Enterprise, which is the inter enterprise-grade version of Redis. So if you are a company that is very large, you probably want Redis Enterprise, or you're a small company and you use a whole lot of Redis, you probably want Redis Enterprise. So um, for those of you who don't know much about Redis, let's go into a little bit more about what Redis is fundamentally. So uh, Redis descends from the idea of a key value database or a key value a data store. Um, when I say descends from that, because we're not purely a key value database, we're actually a structure store. This is our logo up here, and it's got the little shapes in it, right? And those shapes represent structures. So in Redis, you have a key, that then you have a structure on the other side of that key, which those structures started out as, as kind of uh, computer science fundamentals linked lists, hash tables, that sort of thing, right? So when you have a, uh, that, you have a key, and then maybe you have a hash on one side or a linked list on the other side, um, and then you can do things with that. And it's all in memory, it's very fast, it's built in C, so it's about as close to the hardware as you wanna get. Um, so we do about, the uh, Redis Enterprise can do about 50 million operations per second uh, with 26 servers, so a pretty modest thing to get a whole lot of performance out of a minimal amount of hardware. Um, but key value in the structures linked list, you can get so far with it. Uh, Redis was written by a guy named Salvatore Sanfilippo. He's actually based in Sicily, um, more remote than maybe Edmonton. Um, but he, when in Sicily, he kept on getting these GitHub requests in the open source version. Hey, Salvatore, I want to do something else with Redis. It's really great, it's really performant. And he's a great developer, and he said, no, scope creep is, re is real, and I don't want to make Redis anything else. I want to keep it small, I want to keep it light, I want to keep it performant. And that happened for literally years. He would just close a GitHub pull request as soon as it was open when somebody says, I want to do something else with it. And he said, no, these are the structures we have, we may add more later, but I don't like your request. Okay, that's one way of dealing with the world. But actually he started listening and it kind of got to a point where he said, well, I want to do something else and I want to make people happy, but I also want to keep it small and light. And so we entered the module system that allows you to build actually new data structures into Redis. So data structures can be anything as simple as something like a JSON store to as complex as a graph database. And you'll see tonight as well an artificial intelligence platform. So, and that's where this comes in. So it's interesting uh, what <laughs> I can and can't say tonight. Uh, originally when I talked to Drew, I had this whole thing I was gonna tell you all about, and then I got embargoed, which is, we're gonna have a big release of this on April 2nd, so I can't even tell you the name of this product that I'm demoing tonight, but it, you'll see it, um, so it's really cool, you'll like it, um, but this is the logo that we use. Um, I can show you that. Um, so one of the things about it, when you start to think about artificial intelligence, uh, you tend to think about a few things. You think about training your models, you think about serving your models, and, and that's where we started thinking, when, like, where does Redis fit into this world, right? 
So in training, uh, you have a few different markers on it. And I want to preface something. I am not an expert in artificial intelligence. I am a database guy, pure and simple. I know enough to be dangerous in most ways in artificial intelligence, but that's about it. So, um, and please, I will be very upfront if I don't know something, uh, but when training, you have a tremendous amount of data. When you're talking about in-memory database platform, tremendous amount of data to get really expensive. So maybe not a great fit um, in training. You generally don't need real time. You know, this is a process that happens in the background. Batches are very common when you're training data. Also something maybe not really needed. In memory is about real time. 50 million operations per second is real time. It's at scale. Um, and when you're training, you're probably doing something relatively specialized from many different angles, uh, maybe from the hardware you're using to the people who are doing it and that sort of thing. Now, on the serving side, when you want to make predictions and you want to make it useful, you want to do some other things, and it's quite the opposite. If you have a trained model, um, it's actually relatively small. That's actually something that we can fit in memory quite easily. Um, and you know, Redis ranges from people who use megabytes to the hundreds of terabytes is where we tend to see people say, wow, that's a lot of data in Redis, right? When you start getting a petabyte scale, that's impractical in Redis. Uh, you really need real time when you're predicting. If you're doing anything that is customer facing, if you are building an application that is doing something, you don't want to you know, somebody give you some sort of data and then you wait five minutes or 30 seconds. That's unacceptable for that type of use case. And then um, you should be able to run it on commodity hardware or, or in, in instances, namely AWS. The world runs on AWS and you have to run it on the dead simple platform. You don't you have to do anything special to it. You want to be able to deploy a lot of it and scale up as much as you want to. Okay. So you can see where we, we fall in this spectrum, right? We're clearly on this side. So we don't do anything with, we don't care how your data is trained. We want to help you serve it and make it operational, okay? Um, so just to kind of bring it into a little more clear focus, how it works, uh, you have your data, you've trained it, and that's fuzzy and we don't really care, okay? You've done that, you're smart, you know. Um, then we have a pluggable back end. And tonight we'll be using TensorFlow, um, but other, uh, different uh, type of methods are possible. You upload your model into Redis. You then upload your subject. It can be binary, it can be text, it can be blobs, that sort of thing. And then you get your prediction out of it with your language of choice. So if you have your data science people building something and they're very comfortable in Python or whatever, or but your people who are actually building the application use something entirely different, that's a problem a lot of times when you're trying to serve predictions. So you can use Redis and Redis, basically, the language that you're building your end user application in, it doesn't matter because Redis is Redis and it's, you can just send arbitrary commands to it. And we're available in 48 different uh, programming languages. And we have 260 clients, so there's several clients for many languages. Um, so you can do a lot of different things with it. So, um, why would you do this? One, ease of development, right? Um, your library and language independent. So it doesn't matter what you're doing. This is, you're connecting, your Indian application is connecting to Redis, and that's all it needs to know. So advantage, a, a huge advantage there for operational use. Um, you don't need any specialized skills. And that's where I come in and I say, hey, I don't know a whole lot about artificial intelligence, yet I was be able to build this demo that you'll see in a minute in about 48 hours. So, okay, I got some help, but not a whole lot, actually. Um, and it decouples uh, training from serving, so that's an advantage as well. So you can change things around, you can change front ends, you can change all sorts of different things, and you never have a problem. Finally, the ease of operation. So uh, predictions at the speed of RAM. So we, everything we do in Redis is focused on making sure it is as fast as possible. So that being said, uh, everything serves from RAM in Redis. So we have a way of persisting our data, but we are a RAM-first database. So you can persist, but it's everything's at the speed of RAM because of that. So when you're serving your application, you are, you're doing it all without ever hitting any type of spinning disk, any type of SSD or anything like that. And you scale the database layer. And there's something advantage, a huge advantage to that. If you're building a large architecture, your architects and the companies that you're building, they may have a whole system built out where you have your serving layer, your, well, that might be a web server or something like that. Uh, and then you have your database layer and the database layer needs to be separate because your, let's say your web application can handle uh, you know, 100,000 requests 
per second, but your database needs to handle, because that's many times a million operations per second, right? Um, so you need to be able to scale those in a granular way. So by having the prediction at the database layer, you are then allowing scaling to be more granular. So that'll come into play in just a second. And finally, you can look at how things can be triggered, replicated, and managed. And that's something that, you know, when you look at um, how you're looking at your database, uh, replication um, and uh, like geo-replication, for example, do you want to have everything being served out of here, here in Calgary or uh, AWS West? Well, maybe you have customers in Japan. Um, you can replicate across geos, and you can do all sorts of interesting things that would be very challenging if you had to build all this yourself, and you weren't using something like Redis to provide the uh, layer. So let's find some cats. Uh, that's why I wanted you to get your phones out and it, it, get that ready, because we'll, we can do this here in a second. I have some pictures pre-printed. But here's the demo that I built. And like I said, I started this uh, on Tuesday. First thing you do, you have a webcam. We're using webcam on my local machine. I have Redis running on my local machine. It is a pretty small instance of Redis. You can go up very large, but in this case, it is literally running in, I think, uh, 200 megabytes or something crazy like that. Uh, Chrome connects to the webcam, and then you have a JavaScript front end. And all this is doing in this case is taking the information from the webcam, converting it into base64, and then pushing it over a WebSocket. And we'll see how that works in a second. On the back end, you have uh, Node.js, which is connected to Redis. And that's it. There is nothing else in the back end. There's nothing running besides two instances, uh, two little processes, the JavaScript process and the Redis process. That's it. And inside this Redis process is our TensorFlow serving module. Um, again, I can't tell you the name of it, but you'll see it. Um, so you have everything connected via WebSockets, right? So these things are connected in a way that when you get the webcam information, it will be sent through WebSocket to the JavaScript, which will then send it to, upload it to Redis, and ask for a prediction based on it. And that's all it does. Uh, all together, this is 160 lines of code. That's 130 lines of code. Not a whole lot. Um, and everything's there. I mean, this is not, this is the demo. This is not uh, production level stuff, but uh, all right. Here's where the really stressful part happens. Um, so I'm going to kill the slides. Let me switch over. OK. Hi. OK. Um, so I'm going to, I have some pre-printed things, uh, just some pictures that I printed off of my black and white color print, or black and white printer. Um, and we're going to see how this works. What is it? What is it? Everybody see this? What is this animal? Bear. OK. It says it's an ice bear. Close enough. It says that I'm a shower cap. I don't know what that means. but. <laughs> and uh, we got this type of cat. I'm not a cat person. I'm allergic. But uh, let's take a look at this. Is that a Siamese cat? OK. What is this? Husky. Uh, it's supposed to be a wolf, but you'll see. I think that it'll agree with you. Malamute this time. Sometimes it says husky. Sometimes it says wolf. It depends on the angle which I'm showing it. This cute cat. Again, I'm not a cat person. And is that a Persian cat? Looks like it. If anybody has any pictures of their, their pets, you can show it and we'll, we'll run it. It's not just these pictures. It will detect anything. Um, so uh, this is something that is just completely pre-trained. You want to do it? Come on. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just show it to the webcam. Uh, a little closer. Cowboy hat. Miniature schnauzer. Is that close? Yeah. OK. Close. So this is ridiculous. Um, a lighter, that's good. <laughs> a pug, there we go. Um, anybody else have a pet? What is that? This is going to be really hard. I don't think it's going to get this one. A paintbrush. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, this is a ridiculous thank you, by the way. I love seeing these animals. Italian greyhound, that's actually what kind of dog I have, but it says it's an Iggy. It's not an Iggy, it's a Datsun, right? 
close enough. A red bone. Italian Greyhound. Sorry, I can't make that one. Okay. But close enough. Mess it up. Yeah, OK. A shoe shop, a Siberian Husky, a f footed ferret. <laughs> that was good. So uh, as you can see, and this is happening in about 85 to 120 milliseconds on a, just a laptop, right? So if you scale this up to something like a real instance, you can get this down to about 50 milliseconds. So you could operationalize this so you could completely run this as a real instance. And like I said, this is, I can show you the code. Can't tell you the name of the product, but I can show you the code. Um, it's very simple. So um, that's all I have. Does anybody have any questions? I will try to answer them the best I can. In the back. TensorFlow GS or TensorFlow? Okay. It's JavaScript, yeah, yeah. But it, yeah, okay, so that's a good question. Right, oh, so Node.js here is all it's doing is actually sending it to the serving module, which has TensorFlow running. So it's got a C version of TensorFlow in Redis, if that makes sense. Yeah. So what is different between yours and the TensorFlow GS? Yeah, so. It's taking TensorFlow C, which is integrated into our Redis module. Um, at that point, we have a pre-trained uh, thing that we have uploaded to Redis. And all Node.js here is doing is actually just taking the image as a blob and sending it into Redis. So that's all it has to do. And it's, like I said, pretty, pretty simplistic. Redis is handling the serving of all of this. So you can go and replicate all of this. So TensorFlow is actually doing the prediction, but it is integrated directly inside of Redis. So it's TensorFlow at the database level. Yep. Right. Oh, sorry. sorry. So the question was, was, why don't you just hook it directly to uh, Node.js, right? That's the question. You could hook TensorFlow directly to it. The ability is that decoupling of your serving layer from the actual uh, TensorFlow module. So now you ha you're at a different layer in the application stack. So that's where the advantage here is. If I was to put this directly into Node.js, the performance would be much less um, for a number of reasons. Uh, but the other thing that is that if you had it in uh, TensorFlow, just Node.js, those two are coupled together tightly, and you try to do this, and let's say that you need to handle 100,000 operations per second, you are unable to do that at a uh, large level. If you do this now, Node.js is very light, and you can just start scaling up into more instances of your database. So it's about a scaling play, if that makes sense. How are we doing on time? We're good. We're good? Am I done? No. Okay. Why don't you use TensorFlow serving? I'm sorry? TensorFlow serving. Why am I not letting TensorFlow do the serving? Yeah, okay, so that's a good question. Um, so why are we not letting TensorFlow do the serving here? Um, TensorFlow is great, but if you ever try to scale out, with TensorFlow, it can be quite problematic. We handle all the network requests, we handle all the data management, we handle all of the data flow inside of this. So you actually have minimized a lot of, of that and you can use any language you want to to interface with this and you have two separate layers here. That, I hope that answers your question. Is this piece that's coming out, is it open source as well? It will be, that is a good question. It will probably be source available, which means that it will have some restrictive license on it um, where, I'm not sure yet. That's, some of our modules are released under that platform. And, and basically, that's just to prevent somebody else from saying, hey, I'm going to run this as a managed service. That's, that's what we're probably going to do. In the back of the Stripe shirt. Do we have scaling curves or uh, data? Do we have scaling curves? I do not personally. I have not seen that information yet. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, we do not have a formal benchmark at this point. We don't have a name at this point, so uh, we don't have a formal benchmark. Our informal benchmarks are showing that we're about, I think, five times to 10 times faster than comparable systems. But that's, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll have to repeat that. Yeah, it would depend on several things. Um, it would depend on what you're sending, right now I'm sending a very low resolution image, right? There is some networking overhead that it occurs. So that would be a dependent variable there, right? Um, this is a blob. There is overhead all throughout this. Um, but, you know, we, we'd like to, to well, it'll be interesting to know what will happen. This, this will be released. You'll have a name. 
and more formal information and benchmark, that sort of thing, on April 2nd at our user conference in San Francisco. Um, but this is early. This is pretty early. Um, the kind of sources originated pretty far back, but there's been a lot of active development on it within the last four months. Um, it was not able to do this and have any type of stability. Uh, but yeah, I can tell you that, like, I am telling the, the actual numbers from 100 milliseconds is what I am seeing on my laptop. That's as, about as far as I can get on benchmarks numbers, but this is beta on a laptop, right? This is unreleased beta. So um, yeah, a lot of caveats and a lot of like, things I can't say for certain at this point, but um, April 2nd, there will be a lot more information out about it. Okay. One more question. One more question. Okay. So the question is: Is this a managed service, or is this going to be a uh, like an on-premises solution? Uh, good question. Uh, so effectively, what you have is uh, Redis is offered by Redis Labs as both a managed service and as an on-premises service, and as a managed in your VPC service. Um, so where Redis and artificial intelligence meet. If that's gonna be in the managed service, I can't answer at this point. It's possible, but I can't promise anything. So, sorry to have very vague things for you. <laughs> I thought we were gonna be at a different release date when I talked to Drew about uh, two months ago about this, so, yeah. But hopefully it will be managed. That'd be nice that you could just kind of throw it up there. Yeah, okay, thanks everyone. <laughs>